Welcome to the Longmont Museum. My name is Justin Veach. I'm the manager of the Stewart Auditorium. Who is here for the first time ever? Really? Welcome. Thanks for coming. We're glad to have you here. Um, I wanted to tell you about an upcoming program very quickly. Uh, we're very glad to be partnering with the Longmont Observer to present a debate between incumbent Congressman Ken Buck and Dr. Karen McCormick for the fourth congressional seat here in Colorado. Seating will be first come, first serve. You can visit longmontobserver.org for more info. We are really glad to be partnering and hosting this event this evening and other author events like this with our good friends at the Longmont Public Library. Without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to the new director of the Longmont Public Library, Nancy Kerr. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It is uniquely appropriate to introduce author and award-winning journalist Helen Thorpe today. It's Citizenship Day. You may have read some of her work in the New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, or other publications. Her very first book, Just Like Us, The True Story of Four Mexican Girls Coming of Age in America, won the Colorado Book Award. Soldier Girls, The Battles of Three Women at Home and at War, was named the number one nonfiction book of the year in 2014 by Time Magazine. Ms. Thorpe's recent book, The Newcomers, Finding Refuge, Friendship, and Hope in an American Classroom, kept me completely enthralled as I read her account following the lives of teenagers from 14 different countries all grouped together in one classroom at South High School in Denver. In that classroom at South High School, the classroom teacher, students, and their families are portrayed with warmth, humor, and empathy. The level of deep understanding of each individual was made possible by the time and effort Ms. Thorpe spent in observing and getting to know them during the course of an entire school year, not only in the classroom, but in their homes and with their families. Listen as she speaks of the hurdles the students faced coming out of political upheaval in their home countries only to face a different kind of political upheaval here. My own children's DNA owes itself to German, Irish, Scottish, French, Russian, English, and Native American ancestors. I read this book and appreciated all the more every bit of what their ancestors must have gone through to assimilate into this melting pot culture. I hope that all who go through the program at South High School have great stories to pass on to their children and their grandchildren someday. For me, I can only hope that in a few years I'll be buying the book written by Helen Thorpe, letting us know how they've all fared. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Helen Thorpe. Thank you so much for the loveliest introduction. That was wonderful. Um, I think I see a full house under these bright lights shining. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. This is amazing. Um, I'm actually a library school dropout, and I appreciate <laughs> partnerships with librarians and libraries and bookstores. Um, you know, it's how we authors get to connect with our readers, and I'm really grateful for the support. Um, so this evening, I wanted to share some, some images with, with you all. Uh, some, um, just, just at the outset, I'm going to say a little bit about myself and my background. This is actually a, a picture of my parents um, in the center with, with me as a, a young baby uh, at my christening. Um, my parents are double immigrants. So they both grew up in Ireland. My dad grew up in Dublin. My mom. Uh, is one of 10 kids. She grew up on a farm in a rural part of Ireland. And they both had immigrated to London, which is where they met um, and got married and had me. And my mom is wearing this like very fetching fur hat. I hope you guys can see, uh, along with some other family members. And um, after living in England for just a year, they immigrated to the United States, and something very curious happened to their <laughs> attire and uh, appearance. My mom here is wearing this kind of 
homemade jumpsuit that she made after she discovered <laughs> the hippies in the, the 1960s. <laughs> she made matching jumpsuits for me and my sister. Uh, I'm in red. She's still sewing all of our own clothes with like a good Irish immigrant would do. But um, we're visiting her hometown. Uh, the farm that she grew up on is near the, the town of Virginia in County Cabin. I think you can see everybody in her hometown is, is looking at us wondering like, <laughs> what happened in America? <laughs> so I, I always show this because I say if, if, if people wonder why I like to write about immigrants or um, different cultures me melding and clashing and, and all the things that happen when we have immigration, it's kind of, it's kind of all right here. <laughs> um, the first book that I wrote, uh, Just Like Us, was modeled on some other nonfiction books um, inspired by uh, some of the authors here. Um, William Finnegan, Adrienne LeBlanc, Anne Fadiman. If you belong to a, a book group and you read nonfiction, some of these authors might be familiar to you. Um, they kind of led the way in this genre called narrative nonfiction, where you're telling individual stories that are true and reported like um, a, a, a newspaper story would be, but you're writing almost in a novelistic style where you have main characters and a plot like a novel. Uh, and that's what I tried to do in, in Just Like Us. In that book, I was telling the stories of some young women who were growing up in Denver whose families had immigrated from Mexico. And this is an image of one of the students who has sin since come out publicly about being undocumented and being a dreamer. Uh, she's a DACA recipient right now and um, actually fighting to try to keep the DACA program alive. I identified with these students because, you know, for some reason, I wonder if I'm doing this correctly. Um, every time I hit forward, it, it kind of, uh, I'm going to try just using, there we go. I'm not using the clicker anymore. I'm just going to use this wonderful laptop. I identified with the students in the sense that um, I was the oldest in my family. These are my brother and sister. They're twins. They were born right after my parents immigrated here. And um, the students that I was writing about in Just Like Us were also the oldest in their family and the ones born in another country before their parents immigrated to the US and then their siblings were born here. Um, this image shows a, a celebration when um, the young women that I was writing about actually managed to graduate from college, which was a really big deal for them. They were the first in their families to, to manage that achievement. Um, just one more slide about, about Just Like Us, about the first book. Uh, in the course of, of writing about those young women growing up in Denver, I was very curious, how did they come to live in Colorado? What led their families to move from Mexico to this part of the US? And to understand that, I traveled back to Durango, Mexico, where um, the young woman that I just showed you earlier was from. Her name is Yadira in the book. And her grandfather's hometown, this is an image of a bus station. Um, and painted on the wall of the bus station were all the locations you could catch a bus to from this part of Durango. So you could go to Colorado Springs, Aurora, Colorado, a few cities elsewhere, Dallas, Chicago, Phoenix, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Albuquerque. And then behind the green shrub, you could also catch a bus to Denver, Longmont, or Pueblo. And I thought it was amazing to see this bus station with five different cities in Colorado where I was living and um, understand, you know, the really strong economic links that had, had led so many people to take a bus ride from that part of Durango here to work mostly in agriculture, but in, you know, many other fields as well. Um, after the first book, I became really interested in women serving in the military, and um, the title of this book comes from a, a swag that the National Guard was handing out to women as it was trying to persuade them to enlist. It was handing out pink t-shirts that said soldier girls um, on them to, to some, uh, some of the women in Indiana that I ended up spending time with. And I was interested in this because um, 
like with the first book, I had been really inspired by a big jump in immigration numbers. And here we had a really big jump in numbers of women serving overseas. So f from Korea to Vietnam to Desert Storm, you see just suddenly a huge jump in the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan in terms of the number of women being deployed, uh, 282,000. Um, this is an image of some of the women in that book. And in the center, um, Desma, who's wearing a black t-shirt that says, kiss me quick on it. This is, this is when they're um, in their, the barracks getting ready to deploy out of Indiana. Um, Desma was a single mom with three kids, and she had enlisted in the National Guard, never, ever expecting an overseas deployment. And I was writing about um, her experience and the experience of two very close friends of hers as they unexpectedly deployed. And uh, for me, the, the overseas deployments and the struggle that they then faced to come back home after deploying overseas reminded me of immigration stories. And I know people don't think of those two things as related, but I think foreign conflicts, serving in foreign conflicts, and trying to come back home, the struggle can be similar in terms of trying to manage a very monumental transition from one type of environment to another type of environment. And so I, I thought about it that way when I was spending time with them. Um, when they deployed to Afghanistan first, it was uh, the first time any of the three women I was writing about, um, it, well, it, it, it was the first time that two of them had ever left the country. One of them had been to Mexico previously, but it was, it was a really huge thing for them to spend time in a country like Afghanistan. Um, this was uh, one of the soldiers here, Michelle. Uh, it was the first time she had seen mountains, um, the first time, she shared all these images with me, you know, the, they were seeing kind of very strange looking writing to them on uh, Coke cans that were otherwise familiar. And um, also they had a whole bunch of pictures of strange things written on trucks, which <laughs> they saw all over Afghanistan. Um, and they also were encountering women in a very different type of, um, role culturally than they had ever encountered before. And all three of the women that I got to know were very fascinated by the role of women in Afghanistan, especially the blue burqas that they wore, generally, um, typically covering their, their face entirely. It was just a mesh window to look out of. They, they actually brought one of these home, uh, Desma brought one home to show her children the position of, of women in Afghanistan. Um, and when they were overseas, um, this is a picture of uh, Debbie in the center, and on the on the far side, that's Michelle. They worked together um, on an armament. Uh, they were fixing broken weapons for the Afghan National Army. They were working on Soviet weaponry, AK-47s mostly, that the Afghan National Army was using. And they really, every time they left their base and traveled elsewhere in Kabul or the surrounding area, they put their lives in the hand of this young man who was their translator. Um, uh, he was an Afghan um, who spoke five different languages, including English, and he, they could not make themselves understood or have really any kind of communication with anybody in the surrounding area without his help. And they became very wedded to him, kind of lifelong um, friends. After the deployment to Afghanistan, they came back home and then deployed to Iraq, and that deployment was much harder. It was a, a, a time of peak violence in Iraq, and Desma wound up being attached to a previously all-male unit where she was driving an armored security vehicle, and you see that here right after it's hit a roadside bomb, and the uh, headlights have been blown off, the, the tires are flat, it's undrivable, um, and Desma and all the other uh, people serving in the vehicle came out with traumatic brain injury or concussion. And um, Desma then, her, her attempt to return home 
take care of her children once more, reintegrate, become a single mom again, and, and um, deal with traumatic brain injury at the same time was a, a big part of, 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 the, of the book. So after writing about first immigration and then armed conflict overseas, um, the newcomers was kind of a natural next step for me because it's a story about refugees coming to this country, immigrating to this country after they've experienced armed conflict themselves in their home countries um, to such an extent that it's not safe for them to live there anymore. Um, the, the official definition of a, a refugee is um, somebody who has fled their home country and the United Nations has said it's too dangerous for them to return home. So they essentially have no country anymore. And that was true for all of the young people uh, photographed on the, the cover of this book who are actual students at South. Um, so, so this is an image of South High School. South is both a, a, a neighborhood, regular neighborhood school in Denver that attracts kids from the surrounding neighborhood who've grown up their whole lives in the U.S. And it's also one of the designated places in Denver Public Schools where students are, are steered if they've missed a lot of schooling due to generally war, um, and if they speak foreign languages other than Spanish. So I'm gonna go backwards to the cover again. The kids in the background there, um, each of them uh, had experienced um, uh, armed conflict in, in, in at least one country that they lived in, and, and uh, two of those kids had grown up primarily in refugee settlements. And the young woman in the foreground, an Iraqi refugee, um, also had experienced armed conflict in Iraq after we invaded there and then after civil war ensued in Iraq. And in all their home countries, pretty much uh, the education system was decimated by conflict and it was impossible for kids to go to school anymore. So resettlement um, is basically their shot at an education. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, but this is an image of their teacher, Eddie Williams. So um, when I showed up at South High School, the principal invited me into the school and said, I read your first book about undocumented students. I know you'll uh, empathize with the students we have at South you can spend as much time as you want in our school building. And I ended up spending a year inside this teacher's classroom. He's teaching the very basic level English language acquisition. So kids come to him when they arrive, they're coming straight from a refugee camp, they've just arrived in the US and they have pretty much no English whatsoever. And some of the kids who arrived in his room um, Methuselah showed up at age 15 with his brother Solomon at 17, and um, those two brothers were from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and I did not understand until I spent time in their classroom that, that the Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo is actually the number one sender of refugees to the United States. If you work in refugee settlement or you work with refugees in any you know, fashion, you'll know this, but um, I think you know, the general public isn't really aware um, that that's the country that sends us the largest number of refugees, and it's because the Congo has had um, two decades of civil war, and then after the civil war, just chronic violence. And so for a very long time, there's been armed conflict, especially on the eastern side of the country where Solomon and Methuselah were from. Also in the classroom, on the uh, far left side of this image is Kire. He arrived again at age 15, and Kire is from Burma originally, um, but he grew up, he, he was born inside and grew up entirely inside a refugee camp in Thailand. Um, in Thailand, if you show up there as a refugee and you're um, you find a, a refugee camp to live in, essentially you are imprisoned there. You are not allowed to leave. And that was the circumstance he and his family were in. 
Um, it's because Thailand does not want refugees circulating freely in Thai society, so they're um, treated like illegal immigrants uh, and kept inside these kind of refugee imprisonment camps almost. Um, Kiray had the idea that his family should attempt to resettle in the US, and he persuaded his parents to apply. And he was really um, ecstatic when they got the chance to, to, to come to Denver. It was their first, ex you know, his first experience of a large urban high school, um, trying to master English, but also his first experience of freedom, living outside of a refugee camp in any way, shape, or form. Um, this is a, a day when they had just finished a kind of a, a big competition and they're like getting to blow off steam playing cards and he's, he's playing cards here with another student, Jacqueline, and she also arrived at 15 with her sister Mariam, who was 16, and they were from Iraq, which is the number three sender of refugees to the U.S. So the classroom ended up kind of mirroring the global refugee crisis almost perfectly. It had students from the Congo, number one sender of refugees, students from Burma, multiple students from Burma, that was the number two sender of refugees this particular school year. And then these two sisters from Iraq, which sends the next largest number of refugees here. And in the years since, that's fluctuated a little bit. Sometimes Iraq has come ahead of Burma in terms of numbers sent, but usually Congo's at the, at the top. Uh, we tipped off the Iraqi refugee crisis after we invaded that country and then the civil war began. And um, Jacqueline and Mariam, uh, their father sided with the US military. And so um, after he um, worked with US military directly, their, their family was targeted and they had to, by militia groups, and they had to flee for safety. Their father went missing and is presumed dead. So they and their mother um, came to this country without their father. And uh, before they arrived here, they had tried settling in elsewhere in the Middle East and they had gone to a country that they, where they thought they would find safety. It was then a very stable country. It was very close to Iraq and the type of Arabic spoken there was very similar to the type of Arabic they spoke in Iraq and that was Syria. And then they experienced the Syrian civil war. And so they are double refugees. And that's actually um, not uncommon for Iraqi refugee families to have settled somewhere else, often in Syria, and then had to, had to uh, uh, uproot themselves again. Um, ultimately, Eddie Williams uh, uh, had 22 students from 14 different countries in his room. And, um, they arrived uh, speaking many different languages and even using five different alphabets. So uh, his job was to teach all of those students English in the present tense and the past tense in one year, you know, as much as he could. And um, it was amazing to see the work that he did. Um, he employed many different techniques um, one, he borrowed from a teacher upstairs in math class. Um, this is actually a, a kind of a common um, uh, tool in English language acquisition rooms, or in this case, in a math class geared towards students from other countries with limited English. So this is called total physical response. Their math teacher is teaching the kids to pantomime math. So right now they're learning slope positive slope and he'll, he'll say do negative slope and they'll reverse their arms or they, he'll, he'll say let's talk about addition, show me addition and they'll do the sign for addition or multiplication. So it, um, this pantomime has uh, multiple uses. Uh, not only can the teacher sort of remind the students, you know, uh, if he says the word slope and they can't remember what that funny word means, he can kind of show them and they'll, they'll remember, oh yeah, that math concept that involves a diagonal line. But um, also, if they physically act out a concept as they say the English word, um, they're utilizing different parts of their brain at the same time. It kind of reinforces learning new words and it actually aids in acquiring the English terms faster. So 
downstairs in Eddie Williams' room, he was doing a lot of this as well. And for him, it would, it, he would say like, open your books, or let's walk over to this part of the classroom. And he would pantomime a lot of what he was doing and ask the kids to do the same. And then they would remember the English terms better. Um, so I was uh, visiting Eddie's class downstairs kind of on a daily basis. And I was visiting their math class. I also started traveling with the kids who were often taking hour-long commutes to get to South, which was really amazing. Their dedication in terms of showing up at school was extraordinary. They knew the opportunity they'd been given, and they were not at all taking it for granted. Um, and then I began visiting families at home. Uh, this is Jacqueline and Mariam's mother, Eptisam, on the left. And um, as I mentioned, she's a single mom of three. And for her, it was very challenging um, becoming economically self-sufficient. She ultimately found a job in a factory where she could support uh, all three of her children. And our translator, Nabiha, is, is in the photograph as well. Nabiha is also from Iraq. I could have no conversation with Eptisam throughout the entire year without Nabiha being present, helping us um, communicate. And ultimately, I had to hire 14 different interpreters to explain myself to each of the different students in the room and to visit as many parents as I could. Um, this is a, a photograph of Solomon and Methuselah's father. Um, he spells his name T-C-H-I-Z-A, but when he was applying to become a refugee, the United Nations heard it differently, and so they spell his name K-I-I-Z-A, and that's how his name is spelled on all the official documents. Um, he was very um, interested in uh, understanding government in the United States. He had been a leader in his village. He, he was a, a farmer. He also was a teacher. He had worked in a high school. He had taught other farmers how to grow more crops. And then he had, he had run for office. And so he wanted to visit like places like the State House. That's, that's where we are. Um, in this photograph, which we did, um, in between, you know, me interviewing him about what what had led his family to to leave the Congo. Um, Kiza had two older sons who were no longer in school, who all found jobs. So he found a job, and his two older sons found jobs. They were economically self sufficient by 90 days after arrival in the U.S., which was really extraordinary, and that's the goal that refugee resettlement agencies have for immigrant, um, for refugee families. And um, it was amazing to watch this family uh, get those jobs, start working right away. Kiza was washing dishes in a corporate cafeteria. His two sons were cleaning the public areas of hotels. Um, some of the other families in the room, like Kiray's family, his father was working in a meatpacking plant. The same was true from the other family from Burma. Um, so these families were taking kind of any sort of job that they could, no matter how difficult, especially if it was a job where you didn't need a lot of English and you could still earn a decent living. Um, so at the end of the school year, I had a very extraordinary opportunity um, I was chatting with um, a, a friend who knew that I had written these various books, and he introduced me to some military personnel from the Air Force Academy who were traveling to the Congo. And the Congo is, is the large country in light green in the center of this map of Africa. It's a huge place the size of Western Europe. And the two instructors from the Air Force Academy here in Colorado were traveling there to try to understand demilitarization. Um, so as I was writing the newcomers, you know, I wanted to tell the story of how Eddie Williams was teaching English to all these students and also share the stories of why these families had come to the U.S. And I think, you know, I'm fairly familiar with the Iraq War. Probably people in this room are fairly familiar with the Iraq War because we were direct participants in that. So we, we know about that conflict. We know something about it. Um, for me, uh, and I think for many readers, the conflict that happened in the Congo is less well understood and maybe less 
covered in our media. And so I went along, I tagged along with the two Air Force instructors as they went to the Congo to understand what was happening there. Um, we were actually denied visas, and the Air Force instructors said, no problem, we'll just sneak in as tourists. And I said, okay. <laughs> so that's what we did, which technically not supposed to do as a journalist, but um, we slipped in to the Congo from the eastern side through Rwanda. We're on the Rwandan border right here. Uh, we bought a safari that we never went on to <laughs> prove that we were tourists. Um, we did do kind of a tiny little bit of just sightseeing, um, trying to understand the city of Goma, which was the largest big city close to where Solomon and Methuselah were from. They were from a province called North Kivu. And this is just a picture of a very typical um, situation. This man is trying to move some goods that he's purchased, and he's using a homemade scooter with wooden wheels to, that he pushes. It's called a chukudu, and that's a very typical form of like manual transportation. If you, if you don't own a car or a vehicle, how you would move goods around. Um, we visited a really large market, which was selling all kinds of food and all kinds of fabric and electronics. Um, Goma was a, a, a center of trade. All the little villages around, people would be bringing everything that they had grown or harvested. Um, the city of Goma and the surrounding area, North Kivu and South Kivu, are the site of the bulk of the conflict in the eastern part of the Congo. And infrastructure is very difficult as a result. There is an active volcano nearby. You can see like lava flow in the streets here. Again, kind of an informal market with villagers just trying to sell anything that they've grown to earn a little bit of money. But because of the difficulties caused by the volcano and then this chronic conflict, um, the streets have not been repaired. And so it's a, it's a very kind of um, difficult environment. You see vehicles breaking down all over the place due to the bad roads. I mean, really bad roads. Um, the level of conflict, so the two civil wars in the Congo at one point expanded to a kind of, it's kind of metastasized and nine different surrounding countries got sucked into. One of those conflicts, it became known as the African World War. Five million people died either um, directly as a result of that war or because of disease that spread in the wake of the conflict. And then in the aftermath, especially in this part, North Kivu, South Kivu, um, just some militia groups just became entrenched and just never went away. So um, young men who had armed themselves, given up farming, and were just stealing food from villagers or, you know, swooping down on villages and raiding for women as well as any food they could steal had become just kind of a way of life. And the, the uh, Air Force instructors were trying to study how do you persuade those militia groups to put their arms down and go back to civilian life and stop marauding and causing havoc and, and creating this kind of constant difficult environment. Um, there were so many uh, villages where conflicts were, were taking place that there were many, many orphans, and we visited an orphanage. And this is actually a picture, it's, I'm sorry, it's a little blurry, but that's a homemade soccer ball made out of plastic bags wrapped around one another, and that's what the kids were, were playing with in the orphanage. Um, this part of the Congo is the site of the largest peacekeeping mission that the United Nations does. It has 23,000 personnel, mostly soldiers, stationed there, and that's a UN armored security vehicle. Um, we visited many different facilities, including this hospital, which specializes in treating some of the atrocities that happen. And the nurses there were so incredible. This Again, it's not a wonderful photograph, but I took it because um, these are nurses who on their lunch break were, were singing gospel music um, to, 
they said, we went over and chatted with them, and they said they just thought that the singing would um, sort of uplift people. So while we were visiting the Congo, we, we, we kept seeing signs of the surrounding chronic violence, but we also kept seeing just incredible resilience of the people and um, the aid workers there who were trying, the nurses and, uh, uh, you know, the people working at the orphanages, all the people who were trying to help the country put itself back together again um, was really inspiring. Um, after visiting the Congo, um, spending most of our time in Goma, I did try to travel to the village that Solomon and Methuselah were originally from, and it was a bad time to go. There had been a new outbreak of violence, and aid workers had just pulled out of the area, and everybody told me I couldn't travel there without endangering anybody I was traveling with, as well as myself. So we, we decided not to try to get to the village. Um, and instead, I, I met with some of their family in Goma, and they traveled to come meet with me. And then after meeting with family there, um, we went to Uganda, and we essentially were retracing Solomon and Methuselah's footsteps. So their family fled from the Congo, which is uh, to the west of Uganda on the left side of the screen, and they walked east into Uganda. And you can see on its eastern side, Uganda has, this is a map of the refugee settlements in Uganda. It has many settlements, and it's housing more than half a million refugees, primarily from the Congo, but also from Sudan and other countries that have conflict that are nearby. Um, Uganda is one of the most generous host countries in the world. Um, unlike Thailand, it has a, an open policy. If you are a refugee and you show up in Uganda, you can walk into any of these settlements and, and stay there, and you can come and go as you please. Um, uh, it's also very generous in terms of kind of, you know, trying to provide education for kids in these camps. Um, this is an image of the very makeshift kinds of structures that refugees showing up in the Kiangwali refugee settlement. That's where Solomon and Methuselah lived for many years before arriving in Denver. And that's the settlement we visited. Um, when you first show up, you're just given a tarp and you're asked to construct whatever you can to try to stay dry. And then over time, you're encouraged to build something more permanent. Um, and most families will build a, a, like a mud brick hut. Um, wattle and daub is the term for this kind of construction. And if they're lucky, they'll put a tin roof on. I took a picture of this particular home because somebody had painted on the side of it, God is good um, there. Um, we had a kind of incredible experience visiting this settlement. As we were um, traveling there, um, we got lost, and uh, it's in a remote part of Uganda, and we weren't sure of the way, and we ended up stopping to ask directions, and uh, a very well-dressed young woman, um, this, this is her, she has her back to the camera here, um, she ended up uh, giving us directions and then asking if she could have a lift, so she came with us, and we were just chatting with her as we were there, and she ended up explaining that she was from North Kivu in the Congo, and she had grown up in the refugee settlement as a child. She was now a college student in the capital city of Uganda, putting herself through college, working odd jobs, saving up money, and then paying tuition. And she was coming back to visit her own family, but she ended up sort of just helping us the whole day and being my translator. And here were... Um, trying to find Solomon and Methuselah's relatives. So there's 42,000 people in the settlement, and it's 90 square miles, roughly. And they're spread out over 16 villages, and we have no idea what village they're in. And Tamare, who, it, that's the name of our hitchhiker um, slash guide, um, you know, we said to her, how would we possibly try to find one family. And she's like, 
no problem, let me make a few phone calls. So many people in the settlement, if they have any money at all, will buy a very cheap flip phone. And they don't need a plan like we have with our smartphones. Um, uh, the, the flip phone and, and a SIM card um, is, is enough to establish communication. And uh, some of the huts in the settlement even will have one solar panel, and they're, they're used communally. People will charge their, their phones there. A phone is essential because if you're going to get a call from the UN saying you've been accepted for resettlement, they have to have a way to contact you. And it's also the only way you can stay in touch with the rest of your family wherever they are. So she used her flip phone to call a few other people living in the settlement who were leaders in the community, and they said, oh, there, go to this one village, which is where we are in this image. That's where people from that part of North Kivu are, are mostly concentrated. So we were just going around introducing ourselves to random people, and I'm saying, hi, you know, do you by any chance know Solomon and Methuselah? And you know, they're all like, um, no, sorry, no idea who you're talking about. Until Tamare um, ended up speaking with this man in the white baseball hat on the far left side. He's a pastor, and he he um, is very well connected. And he, it it turned out his wife, who's wearing the green shirt in the front image here. Um, she is Solomon and Methuselah's first cousin. And so she's holding my phone, looking at a picture of them, and her, her face has just broken into this huge smile. And we ended up kind of staying and, and sharing all the images we had. She jumped into our car with us, and we drove to visit their uncle, Samuel, here. And Tamara is, again, interpreting for me. And, um, you know, I was asking him about life in the settlement. He was explaining a lot about what it means to live there. Um, but but for, for much of the time, I was simply showing him every image I had of Solomon or Methuselah or their parents, um, their school, Denver, uh, like totally trying to explain their life um, in the U.S. And he was... He was really transfixed and was listening very intently and asking all kinds of questions about how were they doing. And um, I, Solomon and Methuselah had become the two students in the classroom that their teacher was um, most amazed by. They learned more English than any other student that year. And they ended up, at the end of the school year, um, skipping forward a year and a half over um, some intermediate English language acquisition classes to go into a very advanced English language acquisition class. And then halfway through their next school year, I watched them actually transition into mainstream classes and they started reading To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, their learning curve was extraordinary. I mean, they were just sponges for soaking up uh, knowledge at South. And I was kind of describing that to their, their uncle, um, and I think, you know, he was delighted to see images of them and I think obviously very proud of their success. Um, he was explaining, though, to us when I was asking how he was doing and how the family's still there, how they were faring, they're really trapped in a subsistence lifestyle. And so they're in a drought-stricken part of Uganda growing uh, whatever they can to eat, but just growing enough to feed oneself and one's children is a full-time occupation. And in fact, many families take their children out of school starting after third grade because they just can't grow enough food without the, the help of the children either to work in the fields or scavenge for firewood to do cooking or to haul water to water the crops and to cook with and to, to bathe with. So the lifestyle is simply so difficult that something like only 4% of teenagers are still in secondary school. Um, so, so many kids are starting out in elementary school, but very few are making it through secondary school inside the refugee settlement. So by leaving and getting the chance to resettle here, Solomon and Methuselah are having just 
an unbelievable opportunity that simply is not available to the bulk of teenagers living in the settlement and education. Um, Samuel told us where we could find um, Solomon and Methuselah's cousin, Stephen, who's one of these students here, and then this is a close-up of him. And I ended up sort of showing him the same images of his cousins, which initially was pleasing to him. He was delighted to see their faces, but then actually very quickly became upsetting for him. It was very obvious because I was showing him this kind of paradise in Denver with a very fancy Western, you know, developed country classroom with a carpet and electric lights and books and computers. And where he is going to school, you know, there there is none of that in this classroom. It's just natural light. It's a concrete floor. There are no books. They've got maybe maybe a notebook that um, they're often sharing. It's, it's incredibly rudimentary uh, conditions. And so it was quite painful for him to see the life that had not been offered to him. One percent of refugees are chosen for resettlement, so he is part of the 99 percent stuck inside a refugee settlement or that type of environment. Solomon and Methuselah are part of the one percent who are chosen and, and you know, get to have an extraordinary life here. And just the injustice of that from his point of view was really incredibly painful. And I ended up writing about this encounter because it was upsetting to me. I didn't mean to hurt him um, by sharing, you know, news of his cousin's success. Um, but it really illuminated for me just, you know, the predicament of the kids left behind. And so I, I write at the end of, of Newcomers about um, the lack of education available in the refugee settlements. Um, while we were traveling in Africa, while we were in Uganda, and especially while we were in the Congo, one thing that became apparent to me is just the economic ties between the Democratic Republic of Congo and the United States. So, Cobalt, the, the Congo is the, the two-thirds of the world supply of cobalt is found in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's the main ingredient in lithium-ion batteries. And the Congo is also the world's main source of coltan, which is a rare metal that is used in miniaturization of electronic devices. So the laptop that we're using tonight, my cell phone in my pocket, they both have coltan in, in, in them. Anybody's cell phone in this room will have coltan in it. And uh, coltan and cobalt are being mined in the Congo, but these militia groups are sweeping down and often um, stealing the proceeds of mines. So the mining in the Congo is kind of inadvertently funding the militia groups at the same time. And through our electronics trade, we are subsidizing the sort of continued violence, their, their capability to buy arms and to do um, a lot of the harmful things that happen there. And our economic ties and the ways in which we're caught up in this are not, not well understood, but um, there are news stories about it. Just um, in the last few weeks, there was another story on the cover of the Wall Street Journal, which has been one of the main newspapers documenting these economic ties, and it was, um, uh, Say, saying that it's become, the situation's become even worse than at the time that I was there in terms of militia groups profiting off of the mining, despite U.S. companies' best efforts to try to have conflict-free metals. Nonetheless, the, the militia groups in the Congo are managing to smuggle out these metals, and then they melt them down together with ore in other places, and it's all sort of smelted together and then sold as if it's conflict-free, but it's not conflict-free. So we continue, unfortunately, to fund some of the militia groups inadvertently through our electronics. Um, after visiting the Congo, this is um, the, the last slide that I'll show you. I, I, and, and after the book came out, I got to re return to South, where the students decided they wanted to have a press conference themselves and interview me. So they got to ask me questions, um, which was 
I think, super fun for them. And by this point in time, um, you can see Eddie Williams on the far left looking very proud, but a lot of these students that he taught um, had gone on to become leaders in the school. So today, um, uh, one of these students from Iraq is uh, co-president of the student body at South, and uh, Methuselah himself is serving in the student senate and playing varsity soccer. Um, he and his brother Solomon are now seniors and applying to college. Um, they're really thriving. It's, it was extraordinary to see the transformation from how scared and frightened they, they were when they first showed up in Eddie Williams' classroom to a couple of years later here, um, just being so well integrated socially uh, into, into the school structure of, of student leadership and um, kind of social hierarchy there. Um, kneeling in the front is another student, Jonathan. Uh, he has a white t-shirt on. He has become a star runner of the, the two mile, and he, he, um, he's number seven in the state of Colorado, running the two mile for South High School. All these kids are, are leaders in the school in, in one form or another in, in sports or student government. And um, it was amazing f for me to see what was being accomplished at South in terms of just full integration of these kids um, with their American-born peers and how much they were learning from one another. Um, for me, it was an incredibly heartening, inspiring, uh, place to spend time, I, I found it like a, a vision of what the future could be like. Um, uh, I'm going to stop there and um, uh, turn, turn the conversation over to you for Q&A. So you can ask about any of the three books or any of the newcomers in particular, um, any aspect of this talk, and I think the librarians have a microphone here, so we'll actually be able to hear questions. What we're actually going to do is we had a fishbowl in yeah. the lobby and asked people to Fantastic. contribute questions, so we got some really wonderful ones. Um, so first, Helen, someone wanted to know if you plan to keep in touch with all the students from South. Um, absolutely. Uh, there's, there were 22 kids in the room, and I'm going to definitely try and stay in touch with as many of them as I can. Um, in the book, I write primarily about Solomon and Methuselah's family from the Congo and Jacqueline and Mariam's family from Iraq, and a little bit about a family from Burma. And um, those families, those parents, I've, I've stayed in touch with, and I continue to visit at home. But I'm still in touch with most of the kids in this picture, as well as their teacher, um, Eddie Williams, and uh, it's just amazing, you know, every year how quickly the kids continue to evolve. You know, they're ready to go to college now, which is such a leap from where they were when they showed up as scared freshmen back in 2015. Someone else wanted to know if you could revisit any aspect of this project to revise or to revel in the experience, mm. what would that be? Um, f for me, what was most meaningful was um, uh, appreciating um, that these kids were incredibly, incredibly lonely. I think that was the dominant uh, emotion that most of the kids in the room felt when they first showed up because they couldn't speak to anybody else in the room. They didn't understand their teacher and they couldn't communicate for the most part with other students in the room. Maybe if they were lucky, like Solomon and Methuselah, they had a sibling in the room um, and could talk to one another, but they were very, very isolated. And what I loved most and what I would revisit was would be like, say the month of, of May, um, which was the point in the year when they had learned enough English to start to really become friends with one another and flirt and fight. I remember one of the boys proposed to Jacqueline in math class and, <laughs> you know, they were having sleepovers and ironing each other's hair straight or <laughs> all the things that, 
that teenagers love to do. And just the joy in the room, because they had been so isolated and so lonely, once they could begin to make friends in this way and communicate, get past that, that loneliness, the room was just an incredible like font of joy. I think, I remember a conversation with their teacher where we were both saying how uplifting it was for each of us to be in that classroom because the kids were just like bubbling with joy at being able to communicate. If you could do this talk in front of any audience, anywhere, who and where would that be? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love my home state of Colorado because we have been um, such a generous and welcoming place to refugees and to immigrants uh, for the most part. And, uh, you know, it, it, in any state you can probably find um, uh, examples of different kinds of of, of ways that people respond to, to, to immigrants and refugees. But um, by and large, I've been really struck by the generosity that, that this state has shown. We lead the nation. We're number one in hiring um, refugees and in number one in refugees keeping the jobs that they have for the longest periods of time. So we have really good employee um, employer relationships between refugee families coming here and, and people willing to hire them, willing to give them jobs, willing to help work with people whose English is limited um, so that they can earn a livelihood and, and be successful. So um, I love speaking in Colorado. However, there are other parts of the country where there's probably, it, it, it seems like, a, a, a greater need for, for better dialogue. So I should... I should probably think about heading to some of those other places, but it's a little intimidating to think about. Well, the follow-up to that one is, where is the hardest or most difficult place that you've given this talk? Yeah. Um, people who love books, I find, are, are, are by and large thoughtful human beings, and I have, I have really never had an overwhelmingly negative experience at any talk that I've given. I've spoken in New York and Washington and Florida, Texas, um, uh, a whole bunch of different places. And um, just, just generally speaking, people who, who come to a book talk are pretty thoughtful people. I've had some challenging questions um, asked of me, and I've, I've definitely had people kind of express a variety of opinions, um, but it's always, I've, I have felt very fortunate. It's always been very, very thoughtful. And I know there's, you know, this, this great fray <laughs> happening. There's this terribly noisy argument happening um, on Twitter and maybe in our media and so forth. But, uh, as a book author, I am incredibly lucky because I get to travel um, through audiences where people are respectful. If they have a difference of opinion, they ask in a, in a kind and thoughtful way. Um, and I just feel somewhat insulated from the terrible difficulty that we're having right now as a country in having civil conversations. Um, uh, so I have not had personal experiences of, of, of great difficulty. But I, but I look at the debate and I feel, um, uh, I wish that, you know, the, the kind of conversation that happens in a room like this one or in the book groups where people might discuss nonfiction books that are written about refugees and, and immigrants, um, I wish those conversations could, could move out and, and, and um, become more the norm. I, I really am dismayed by the degeneration into name calling and rudeness and all that stuff that's happening right now nationally. It's, it's, uh, 
I hope this moment passes and that we can move on to, to better kinds of conversation, even if we still disagree, just a more civil dialogue. We're switching gears a little bit here. Did your time as a public figure change how you approach writing about other people? Absolutely. Um, I think the experience of being written about is something every journalist should go through. <laughs> and I think y you learn that um, it, it's, it's really impossible for anybody to, to get it right. And so you just you know, are going to do the best job you possibly can. But when you're written about, you sort of both become more forgiving of journalists and, and how they go about things, because uh, of course they're gonna you know, make mistakes and they're just gonna do the best they can. But it, you also, um, it, it, I guess it inspired me to try to do even more, to listen as carefully as I possibly can. Like knowing that we're all flawed and knowing it's very hard to, to tell someone else's story. Um, I started uh, giving my work to the people that I write about so they could read through it before publication. Um, in this case, that was really hard to do. I did give the book pre-publication to Eddie Williams and the principal, but the, the kids and their families, I, I gave them the book, but they were not yet at the point where they could really, uh, their parents especially, were not at the point where they could read the book and you know, comment on it. Um, easily, and so, but with the other books, uh, you know, um, in Soldier Girls, the veterans that I was writing about, or in Just Like Us, the undocumented immigrants that I was writing about, they had a chance to read before publication. So I was trying to make it a little bit more of a col collaborative effort. In tr I was trying to give them like a, an, a proofreading moment, uh, knowing that I'm flawed and will get things wrong, inevitably. Thank you so much. I'm sure everyone here would agree it was a wonderful presentation, and we sincerely appreciate your time being here. Thank you for having me. Don't forget that uh, Helen will be signing books out in the atrium if you would like to get a book signed. Thank you for coming. Thank you.